Dr. Zarif, it's a pleasure to welcome you here. I want to thank uh, Barnett Rubin and Suzanne DiMaggio and all the people who've organized uh, this gathering. Uh, I'm going to ask you this morning about the nuclear negotiations. I'm going to ask you about uh, regional issues. But I want to start uh, with some stories that are in this morning's newspaper that are on all of our minds. First, I want to ask about the uh, stopping and seizure of the crew of a Danish vessel flagged the Marshall Islands called the Maersk Tigris in what the Pentagon has described as an internationally recognized maritime route uh, in the Persian Gulf uh, within your waters, you have, you have claimed. And what I'd like to ask is your reassurance to this audience and to everyone listening that Iran respects free navigation in this most crucial and sensitive waterway. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be here with all of you. And thank you, David, for accepting to moderate this discussion. I'm grateful to two of my old friends, Suzanne DiMaggio and Barnett Rubin, for having organized this. And I see a lot of old friends in the audience. Hello to all of you. Good to be back and talking to you. Uh, as you know, I wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times uh, a couple of weeks ago in which I said, I repeated a, an, a long time uh, policy of, of Iran uh, on freedom of navigation in the Persian Gulf. For us, the Persian Gulf is our lifeline and nothing is more important for us than freedom of navigation uh, in those waters, and we are committed to it, and we will respect freedom of navigation. Uh, this ship has had uh, some rather peculiar activity, as I hear from the lawyer of uh, the company that uh, filed the suit against this company, uh, I think about some 15, 20, 15 16 years ago, uh, for uh, evading uh, to pay or to deliver a cargo. Uh, that's quite some time ago, and it has gone through court proceedings in Tehran based on what I hear from the lawyer, uh, public statements by the lawyer, uh, for the past 14 years, and, and there is a final decision by the court uh, that uh, the ship's owners are supposed to pay uh, the damages that uh, are incurred on the, on the private company. Uh, that uh, had a lawsuit against this uh, company in an Iranian court with jurisdiction over the matter. Um, and simply our naval forces implemented the decision of the court. That's a legal case and it's being followed as a legal case. It's not a security issue or a political issue. For us, freedom of navigation in the Persian Gulf is a must and we are prepared not only to respect it ourselves but we call upon all others to respect freedom of navigation. Usually a, a legal matter of this sort is, is enforced through uh, legal proceedings in the courts. There was a question in many people's minds whether in seizing this ship Iran was sending a message at a time of tension uh, in the region, especially in Yemen. Well, it has nothing to do with Yemen. In Yemen, uh, the unfortunate incidents are taking place. Humanitarian assistance is not allowed to enter Yemen military operation in spite of the fact that uh, there was an announced ceasefire continued to take place actually started uh, several hours after the announcement was made. We certainly hope that um, cooler heads would prevail and we would move towards resolution of that issue. As you know, we have a four point plan that we presented uh, publicly and I alluded to that plan in my op at, uh, in the New York Times. Uh, and we're working with everybody based on that plan. I had a very long discussion with Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations uh, upon my arrival here in, in New York, and we exchanged some thoughts about how we proceed with convening a meeting of the Yemenis in order to find a solution and for everybody else to facilitate that. Unfortunately, uh, in spite of the fact that humanitarian assistance was a major part of any agreement uh, that is being refused. But this has nothing to do with, with that. This is a legal case. Uh, the ship was asked to come to port. It, it refused. 
and uh, our naval forces take a took action to to escort it to to the port. Uh, I, I think uh, we shouldn't read too much into it. Uh, some some people do try to read too much into anything that is taking place now in order to torpedo uh, a process that is independent of all of these problems. We'll return to regional issues and specifically to your uh, proposal for negotiations in Yemen uh, a bit later. But I want to turn now to the uh, subject of the uh, nuclear talks taking place between the P5 plus one and, and Iran. Uh, <coughs> You met with Secretary Kerry here in New York on Monday uh, for a, a conversation, uh, and I want to ask you uh, whether you were able to put together a, a, a timetable or roadmap uh, for completion of this agreement uh, by uh, the June 30 uh, deadline that's been set. And also, uh, Dr. Zarif, just your brief summary of what are the remaining areas of disagreement and dispute that has, have to be resolved to get to an agreement? Well, uh, on, on your first question, uh, actually we did set a timetable in order to move forward. We agreed to work uh, basically non-stop, uh, starting uh, right after we finished this first week of uh, the NPT review conference. Uh, but Tomorrow morning, our colleagues will start at the political directors and deputy foreign minister level uh, to bring together all the elements of a draft document. Uh, we have, we've done some work last week in, in Vienna, uh, again at the political directors level, both between Iran and the United States, as well as between Iran and P5 plus one. Uh, and I believe they will continue starting tomorrow morning to finalize that. Uh, it will have, as those involved in multilateral diplomacy would call brackets uh, in the text. I mean, there, there will be parts of the text that are um, commonly agreed, parts that are not. But I, I think we have uh, general agreement on the concepts, uh, which we call uh, parameters of an agreement. Now, how we transform that agreement into a written, in our view, legally binding document, uh, which will be endorsed by a uh, mandatory resolution of the Security Council. Uh, that is the area where we need to do a lot of work because uh, usually in these negotiations, the devil is in the detail. And we have done some detail in the, uh, during our discussion in Lausanne, but, but there is some left. And uh, it includes all areas. It's not one specific area of difficulty. We need to put down uh, on several pieces of paper, not on one piece of paper, uh, all the details of an agreement. I believe it can be done. I believe it should be done. I believe it's an opportunity for all of us which should not be missed. Uh, and uh, I expect people to start working in good faith uh, and move forward. Could you give us some idea of what's still in brackets, what, what these areas that you've got to resolve uh, disagreements? Well, I mean, the, what's in brackets are wording issues on, on almost everything. Uh, wordings are usually uh, I mean, you have, you have one way of expressing some of the concerns. Uh, others may have a different way. But, but there are wording problems that uh, pertain to uh, all issues. Uh, I don't think they are, uh, the, the problems are insurmountable. I think they can be resolved, and I think they will be resolved. So if, if you want to pinpoint one specific area where there is a problem, I'll be able to tell you, if I decide to tell you, <laughs> at the end of this week when they finish this, I usually don't want to negotiate in public because that's the worst thing you can do, negotiate in public. Uh, you've heard me say that several times, and a lot of people in Iran have heard me say that several times, and some people are not happy uh, with me saying that. But, but we're committed to this process. Uh, we've spent a lot of political capital on this process. I think a lot of people have spent a lot of political capital on this process. This is an opportunity that should not be wasted because we try to score points at each other at this stage. As you remember, I tweeted a couple of hours after, or maybe, maybe less than a couple of hours after, 
we reached the agreement in Lausanne that the agreement is good as it stands. Nobody needs to spin it. And I, I believe we don't need to spin a good agreement. It's a good agreement. It's, it's an agreement that does not reflect all the uh, needs of everybody. Obviously, if you wanted an agreement that reflected every need of every player in the, in the room, you'll never have an agreement. So everybody has to be flexible, everybody has to compromise, and I think people recognize the significance of this opportunity to reach an agreement. It's not a perfect agreement. It's not perfect for us, it's not perfect for the United States, it's not perfect for um, our European Union partners, but it's the best we can get. It's the best that anybody can get. Uh, and it's balanced, in my view, uh, now. Whether we can live with a balanced agreement only time can tell, uh, and we have two months of it. I'm going to try you on a couple of the details, despite your warning. But I, I want to ask you, <laughs> You're uh, a persistent man. <laughs> well, uh, that's people w would want me to, to persist on this, and, and, I, and I will. But I, I want to ask you first about about the timetable. The Supreme Leader said in a in a speech, and I'm quoting here, that the June 30 deadline is not unchangeable. And if this period extends, there will be no problem, which seemed to you know, stretch out the possible negotiating time. But I, I want to ask whether you and Secretary Kerry uh, have committed to and believe it's possible to get this agreement by the 30th of June. Well, we, we, we certainly want to finish this even before 30th of June, if, if it's possible. What the, what the leader has said and what I believe anybody in the right mind would say that if we move uh, quite a bit, and if we believe that there is a good chance of reaching an agreement, we should not kill this opportunity for a few days, more or less. I mean, no, no time deadline is sacrosanct. And we have all agreed that this is a human process. This is not a divine process where you have definitive deadlines. Uh, and even, even, even the divine can change its will, according, at least according to Islamic philosophy. Those who study the Islamic philosophy, even the Almighty can change its will. So uh, th this is where we are. But we want to finish this mm -hmm. way before June 30th. Uh, and, and we will do everything. And as I told you when we started, that we want to use every opportunity. Uh, including working around the clock, starting next Monday. Uh, starting tomorrow, actually, here in New York, and then next Monday somewhere in Europe, to finalize all the elements of the agreement. I'm going to ask you to, to uh, focus, if, if you will, on one area of this agreement that is especially important, I think, to uh, countries around the world that have concerns about the Iranian nuclear program, and that is transparency uh, and uh, inspection. In the joint statement that you and the EU High Representative Mogherini both read uh, on, the, on the day that the deal was, uh, was announced, uh, you said that the IEA would receive enhanced access to Iran's nuclear program. Several days later, uh, Supreme Leader Khamenei said that any inspections and surveillance should be limited to conventional mechanisms. Is there a, a discrepancy there, or is the language that was read that I quoted from you and, and uh, Representative Mogherini uh, the operative language? Well, the, I mean, if, if you're familiar with uh, the NPT arrangements, uh, all members of the NPT, or at least most members of the NPT, have a safeguards agreement with the IAEA, based on which the IAEA will be able to inspect declared facilities. Some members of the NPT have, in addition to the safeguards agreement, an additional protocol, which enables the IAEA to have, uh, within, a, within a legally defined framework, internationally legally defined framework, uh, access to undeclared areas, provided that they have good evidence to, to prove that such access is necessary. And uh, Iran, in fact, did implement the additional protocol from 2003 to 2005 voluntarily. It is prepared to do it again. Uh, and that is the highest level of international transparency 
that is available. Uh, and Iran is prepared to accept that highest level of international transparency. Uh, and that's a standard. Uh, it has not been accepted uh, by the NPT member states as the standard of verification. Uh, and I think that's one of the issues that in the review conference in the next uh, three, four weeks, it will be discussed. There will be some members of the NPT who are reluctant to accept the additional protocol as the standard of verification, but Iran is prepared uh, within an agreement to accept the additional protocol. And I think with that, you will have all the transparency you need, which is legally defined. It's not arbitrary. Mm -hmm. What the leader has said and what, what we will continue to say is that we will not accept arbitra arbitrary encroachment on our sovereignty. That we will not accept, nor will any other uh, respectable country in the world. But we accept the standard level of transparency that is required in order to make, to provide, uh, to remove any doubt, because we believe that there is nothing hidden in our nuclear program, that our nuclear program has been the subject of scrutiny. And you may want to know that according to the 2013 report of the IAEA, not any recent one, the report prior to the implementation of the latest agreement that we had in November, of 2013. Uh, according to the, to the report that was issued in June of 2013, after Japan, Iran had the most inspections of any country in the world for the past 10 years. Most inspections. And Japan has 10 times the number of nuclear facilities as Iran does. What we had after Japan, with, they had 170 nuclear facilities, we have only 17. But with, with 17 facilities, we were second only to Japan in terms of being inspected. So the IAEA has seen everything. And if you're looking for a smoking gun, you've got to wait a long, long, long time before you get one. So just um, so that we'll understand what this uh, language means in practical terms, suppose that uh, several years from now, the agreement is signed, the IEA gets uh, information which leads it to believe that prohibited activity is taking place at Parchin or at a military base somewhere in, in Iran. Would the IEA have access to that base to uh, make sure that the suspicions are, 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 are not uh, correct? Uh, Help us understand that. Well, there is a mechanism. I mean, that, that's what the additional protocol is all about, in order to investigate concerns about undeclared facilities. I mean, what is declared is declared. They have regular access to it. What is undeclared, the additional pro protocol provides a mechanism and a procedure for access. Our agreement, if, if reached, provides more clarification about the procedure, uh, which when, when the agreement is finalized, you will see, it provides a rather clear cut approach to checking such allegations, uh, substantiating them, and then moving forward with, with resolving. Uh, the additional protocol is there, its mechanisms are there, its procedures are there, and the agreement has more specificity, specificity with regard to some of them. I want to turn to a, a question of special interest uh, to the Iranian public, um, which I hope is watching on television as we're talking, and that is the question of sanctions relief. There's been some disagreement about exactly what this uh, framework, these parameters uh, provide in terms of sanctions relief, and I, I want to ask you to, to, to clarify, clarify that for, for, for everyone. First, in, when, and is, uh, under your understanding of the agreement, when will s most nuclear-related sanctions be lifted? Uh, maybe you could speak to that first. Well, as our understanding stand today, and I don't think there is any divergence here, if we have an agreement on the 30th of June, within a few days after that, we will have a resolution in the Security Council under Article 41 of Chapter 7. 
which will be mandatory for all member states, whether Senator Cotton likes it or not. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't <laughs> avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tempted to say you'll pay for that, but you already know that. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, as permanent member of the Security Council, the United States should be in the forefront of, of pushing for respect for the integrity and authority of the Security Council. Um, it will be, the resolution will endorse uh, the agreement will terminate all previous resolutions, including all sanctions, will set in place the termination of EU sanctions and the cessation of application of US sanctions. And the reason for change in terminology is that we don't want to get bogged down into the domestic procedures in the United States. Um, I mean, I've, I've studied and lived in the US. I know enough about U.S. Constitution and U.S. procedures. But as a foreign government, I only deal with U.S. government. I do not deal with U.S. Congress. I do not deal with U.S. Supreme Court. That is the, responsi the responsibility of bringing that into line falls on the shoulders of the President of the United States. And that's the person with whom we are making this agreement. So he will have to stop implementing all the uh, sanctions, economic and financial sanctions, that have been imposed on Iran by executive order, by congressional decision. However he does it, that's his problem. As it will be my problem to implement certain measures, I would not be able, nobody in international law can advance arguments of domestic procedure in order to avoid implementing international obligation. That is correct for Iran, that is correct for the United States. No difference, sovereign equality is a principle of international law on which we all operate. So this, this is it. On the day of, of, of the agreement, we will have a resolution in the Security Council, or a couple of days later, depending on when we reach the agreement. Uh, and that would put into motion certain steps that we will take in order to prepare for the measures that we agree to take, we will have to bring down the number of centrifuges to a certain number in Natanz, to bring down the number of centrifuges to a certain number in Fordow, bring down our stockpile of enriched uranium to a certain uh, weight, do something about our uh, heavy water reactor in Iraq so that we can design, redesign part of that reactor, not the entire reactor, because it will remain a heavy water reactor, as you know from the agreement. Uh, and even the fact sheet, so-called fact sheet, uh, by, by, by the White House. It, it will, but it will be redesigned so that it would address, it would be more modern, it would, it would be uh, more usable for, for our purposes, and at the same time it would reduce uh, proliferation concerns, and it would be done in a, in a joint venture process uh, which would uh, both, of, uh, both provide us with better technology and at the same time provide the other side with greater confidence. All of these measures that we need to take, I mean, they will have to start at a point, mm -hmm. and that point is where we take those measures, pre preparation for those measures, and the sanctions will be removed. How is this will be done, the pro no. I mean, we know the, the concept. The concept is these will be simultaneous. How much time it will take for each of these, how much time it will take for the United States, how much time it will take for Iran, how much time it will take for the EU. These are issues that are being discussed, but they have to have uh, a, a time frame that would make them simultaneous. It won't take much time for the Security Council to adopt the resolution, and that's when this, the, the entire process will get into motion. The, the, the process begins, but just to be, to be clear, it's, is it when the, it's verified that the steps that are agreed, for example, the conversion at Iraq and uh, the reduction of the number of centrifuges, when it's verified that those steps have been taken. Is that the moment at which the sanctions come off? Well, the, these are steps that will take only a few weeks to implement. And uh, sanctions are off. The time that they will be, they will take effect are the time that our steps have taken effect. Okay. So all, all sides will take preparatory steps and 
Uh, we can't get into greater detail about this because I don't want to put anybody into any difficulty. But the time when we start, when we adopt the resolution, if we, if we reach an agreement, then uh, yeah. that, that's an important uh, if. A, f a final um, buzzword from the uh, uh, parameters agreement that, that you reached is the snapback, so-called, of, of, of sanctions. This is important to the U.S. and its negotiating partners, and it, it basically says, and I'm quoting from the U.S. Uh, fact sheet um, that was released in Lausanne, if at any time Iran fails to fulfill its commitments, these sanctions will snap back into place. Um, and uh, I take it the snapback provision is part of what you've discussed, but it's it's reciprocal. Maybe you could, you could explain both aspects. Uh, yeah, actually, that, that's the problem with fact sheets. Uh, <laughs> uh, once we have the agreement, you will see that the reciprocity in that even starts with if Iran believes that the other side is not implementing its part of the deal. It has, through a procedure, it's not, it's not automatic. You see, we didn't spend all this time, 16 months of negotiations, the longest negotiating session of a U.S. Secretary of State in probably history since uh, 19 whatever, 1919 I was told, uh, to prepare a document that we're going to shred once we go back home. So we didn't do this in order to simply snap back. But, but we have a reciprocal procedure, unfortunately because of the, the mutual lack of confidence that exists, so that if each side believes that the other side is not living up to its commitment, it can, after completing certain procedures, revert back. This is reciprocal. It requires a certain procedure that has been agreed upon to be followed before it's done so that we can respect the, the, uh, the agreement. But then we can go back and the other side can go back. Now, one thing that needs to be mentioned here is the record. Over the past 18 months, the President of the United States, in addition to the Director General of the IAEA and a whole range of other people, are on record saying that Iran has implemented every single detail of its undertaking under the November 2013 Geneva Agreement. Unfortunately, I cannot say that about the United States. There is a lot to be desired in the way the United States, particularly the Treasury Department, has implemented its part of the obligation. So if people are worried about snapback, they should be worried about U.S. violating its obligation and us snapping back, not Iran violating its obligations and the U.S. reverting back its sanctions. And that is a point that the United States should be seriously concerned about. This is not a game. This is a serious exercise. And we expect the other side to be as committed to implementing this deal. This is not a voluntary stroke of a pen agreement that can be changed in another stroke of a pen. The United States is accepting a commitment a commitment that requires certainty for our negotiating partners and for our trading partners. And we expect the United States to live up to its commitment. And we have a provision for snapback if the U.S. failed. So if the United States want, wants to sell it as an achievement for the United States, be my guest. But it is a reciprocal situation. So, so if, if Iran judges that the U.S. is not complying with aspects of this agreement, Iran is reserving the right to withdraw from the agreement uh, when it makes that conclusion. No. Am I understanding you? No, 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 no. no. No side can just make the conclusion and withdraw. There is a procedure. We want to maintain the integrity of this agreement. We have invested a great deal in this. So there is a procedure that needs to be followed, and it takes about 60 days for this pr procedure to be completed. But once that procedure is completed, and if the other side, I mean, if the other side commits a material breach, or what we, we, the terminology that we use is significant non-performance 
of the obligations. Then it provides the other side with the possibility of resorting to various procedures in order to make sure that whether they can be rectified, whether they can be corrected. And a lot of issues can be rectified or corrected because this is not sort of a, a, a situation, trigger happy situation that everybody is looking forward to a, an excuse to get out of this agreement. We, we need actually to find excuses to keep the agreement alive, as we did over the past 18 months. I mean, there were many instances in which I took the heat when there was an apparent American, uh, at least lack of good faith in implementing its part of the deal when they increased or uh, added new uh, entities to the sanctions, uh, previous sanctions, or, or similar measures. But we believed that we needed an excuse to find a solution, not an excuse to break the solution. So that part of the political will needs to be predominant if we want to use this opportunity this opportunity is basically once, not once in a lifetime, but once in a decade at least. We had a similar opportunity in 2003 to 2005. I was a part of that. President Rouhani was a part of that. Some of friends that are sitting in this room were a part of that. And we blew it then because people did not, were looking for an excuse not to have an agreement rather than for an excuse to have one. Now, this agreement is totally different from that agreement, but it rests on very similar grounds. I think it would be a travesty to lose this possibility. Let me ask you a final uh, question about the agreement that really is a bridge to talking about regional issues and also is very much in line with this week's theme of nonproliferation. Uh, if Saudi Arabia asked to have the same arrangements that Iran will have under the uh, framework agreement that you're seeking to conclude, would that give Iran confidence that Saudi Arabia's nuclear program was exclusively peaceful? And would you object to Saudi Arabia doing the same thing that Iran will do under this agreement? We would welcome it, actually. We would welcome the same opportunity for all members of the NPT. Now, uh, I, you need to know that on, was it Monday? Uh, on the first day of the NPT review conference, I was the first speaker. Now, the United States claims that it represents the international community. But when it came to the NPT review conference, I was representing 120 members of that international community. And if you read the statement that I delivered on behalf of those 120 members, you see that the big, single biggest concern of the international community is the continued uh, presence of nuclear weapons in the United States and other P5. So that's the single biggest threat to international peace and security, that P5 continue to have nuclear weapons. The second biggest threat is that Israel continues to have nuclear weapons at least from the point of view of 120 member states. And then the third point that I raised there, and that is the position of not only 120 members, but probably close to 180. Now we, in the NPT, we have 191 members, and I think 188 of that 191 members of the NPT believe that every state has the right to choose its fuel cycle priorities. That is, if Saudi Arabia decides to have an enrichment program under the similar monitoring that Iran does, not only I will accept it, I will welcome it, because that's their right. That's their right, and rights need to be applied across the board without discrimination. So they're welcome to do it. Now, the United States has a discriminatory uh, standard called 123 standard, which is a bilateral issue. Uh, we don't have that bilateral agreement with the United States, so we're okay with our own situation, and uh, we're not looking uh, to any bilateral agreement with the U.S. In, in the area of nuclear cooperation. 
if others are not looking at, uh, in, in that particular field, then they should have the right. What they will do in their bilateral relations with the United States is a bilateral issue on which I have no control. If they take uh, obligations in a bilateral agreement with the US, then that's a bilateral agreement. That's not a multilateral but, but issue. Dr. Dr. Zarif, isn't, isn't that a, a somewhat uh, worrying and, and dangerous prospect that over the next 10, 15 years, your neighbors will be pursuing uh, nuclear programs of their own. Is that a, a world in which Iran is really going to be more secure? Well, a, nucle a peaceful nuclear program under necessary international monitoring, under necessary international supervision is nothing to be worried about. You see, that's why you have the NPT. In, in the 1960s, there was a bargain. The bargain was a group of countries accepted for a brief period of time. At that time, it was 25 years. For the United States and other four permanent members of the Security Council to have nuclear weapons, temporarily. And they accept not to have nuclear weapons, but the other side of the bargain was that they could have nuclear technology for peaceful use. And now, unfortunately, the United States and other nuclear weapon states are not observing their part of the bargain not fulfilling their part of the commitment, and expect us to do more than our part. The non-nuclear weapon states have every right to have access to peaceful technology. And again, in my statement, on behalf of 120 members of the international community, I said this distinction between sensitive and non-sensitive technology is, with all due respect, hype. Pure hype. Because everything in, in this area is, new, is, is sensitive. And if you say you cannot enter the sensitive areas, you've got to believe that the majority, overwhelming majority of the international community don't buy that. They don't believe that. The problem is, it, it's interesting, and, and uh, sometimes I find this really, I mean, it's, it is ironic, but it's laughable, that... Netanyahu has become everybody's non-proliferation guru. <laughs> it is laughable, isn't it? He is sitting on 400, 400 warheads, nuclear warheads, that have been acquired in violation of NPT. In violation of NPT. Israel is not a member of NPT. But those who provided it with the technology were members of the NPT and violated the NPT to provide it with the technology. And we know who, who they were. And now they are the proponents of non-proliferation. And Bibi Netanyahu be, has become the guru, their guru in, in this area. So we've got to become real. And look at this realistically. If there is a threat, it comes from Israel's nuclear arsenal not from Saudi Arabia having a peaceful nuclear program. We certainly won't be threatened by that. So let me continue on this um, track of talking about uh, regional affairs. And um, take as my starting point your uh, interesting op-ed piece in the New York Times several weeks ago in which you said it is time for Iran and other stakeholders to begin to address the causes of tension in the wider Persian Gulf region and you called for a collective uh, form uh, for dialogue, uh, a lot of tantalizing ideas, but I want to ask you um, about specific pathways forward. You mentioned Yemen uh, as, as an area where you'd like to see intra-Yemeni dialogue among the Houthis, the different factions. W what has happened on that track? Have you been in contact with the Houthi leadership? Have you urged them to come to a meeting? There are meetings that I'm told are taking place in the UAE with some participants in this process. Is that something? Tell us how you'd like to see a dialogue and a, and a solution in Yemen go forward. Let me take you back a few years. In 1986, that's quite a few years, as a junior diplomat, I wrote a letter that was signed by our then foreign minister, Dr. Velayati, and Johnny Pico is sitting here. He was then at the, secure, at the UN Secretariat. He, was, he received it, in which we suggested 
that we should have a regional security arrangement in the Persian Gulf. Two years later, uh, one year later, in 1987, Security Council adopted Resolution 598, which helped end Iran-Iraq war. Paragraph 8 of that resolution calls on the Secretary General of the United Nations to convene a process leading to the establishment of a security mechanism in the Persian Gulf region. These were our suggestions. So this is not something that I invented two weeks ago when I wrote this, uh, this op-ed. Immediately after becoming foreign minister, I'm jumping because I did a lot of this when I was ambassador here. I have written similar things during that time. But, and we said that after 1991, when Iraq, uh, 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait, we said, had you put that mechanism in place, we might not have had to go through this real tragedy that has basically engulfed our region for the past, I don't know how many, 30 years, 20-some uh, years. And then when I became foreign minister, the first op-ed piece that I wrote was not in New York Times or in Wall Street Journal or anywhere. I wrote in a Sharq al an op-ed in Arabic. The title was, Our Neighbors Are Our Priority, in which I repeated this same suggestion. We are committed to this. We want to have dialogue with our neighbors because we believe there is almost on every issue complementarity of interest between us and our neighbors. Now, we know that they're, they're following policies that we find totally objectionable. We do not believe that you can bombard people uh, to submission. It won't succeed, as it didn't, and it will not create more stability in the region. We don't believe that you should uh, create uh, sectarian strife in the region. I think it's dangerous for everybody, detrimental to everybody's security. So what we do with Yemen, uh, I, I think the concepts are... Uh, clear. We have raised this in the meeting we had with the Turkish president. I raised it with others. We have a four-point plan. First of all, I mean, the most important thing before we get to the four-point is that the security of every country, the domestic affairs of any country is the business of the people of that country. People outside should not set preconditions for them. I think the world has set preconditions for Syria, and we've seen the last four years. I mean, we should have allowed the Syrian people to decide, not for people outside to say, this guy should not be there, this guy should be there. That was a decision by the Syrian people. We, we, some tried to make that decision for them, and that perpetuated the conflict. So that, that's a very important criteria. People of Yemen should decide what will be their future. But how we see that we can help. We believe there should be a ceasefire. We don't have a ceasefire. We've heard lip service to a ceasefire, but we've seen that following the announcement, almost on a daily basis, we've had military operation. We've had airstrikes. We should have humanitarian assistance. The situation in Yemen is dire. The humanitarian situation is catastrophic. And unfortunately, over the past four days, Four Iranian airplanes carrying humanitarian supplies to Yemen were intercepted and returned. In spite of the fact that they had permission, they had overflight permission, and we had informed our Saudi neighbors that these, that what the planes, I mean, what the cargo was. And unfortunately, they were intercepted to the point of an overzealous pilot bombing out of existence the runway in an airport in Yemen in order to prevent our plane from landing. This, well, is, this is the extent to which they, they have gone. Third, an intra-Yemeni dialogue. Everybody in Yemen should engage in a dialogue without precondition. And I, I do not believe that is taking place in the UAE because UAE unfortunately became a part of the conflict. It has to take place in a place that is not a part of this conflict. And I believe the United Nations is contemplating Geneva. And I think probably it's the least common, the lowest common denominator, unfortunately, but that, that may be the only way. And the fourth element of our plan is to establish uh, by the Yemenis 
a broad-based government that has friendly relations with all its neighbors, including Saudi Arabia. Obviously, it's a big neighbor of Yemen and, and other GCC countries and Iran and others. We are all important players in the region. We don't want to exclude any player in the region. We believe that the process of dialogue, by definition, needs to be inclusive. Exclusion is the problem of, our, of, of the current paradigm. We need to include everybody, include everybody in the process, include everybody in the outcome, and to have a broad-based government with good relations with its neighbors. Now, it should be a Yemeni-owned and a Yemeni-operated process. We can facilitate. I have done that. Barney Rubin knows he was involved in Afghanistan in the Bonn conference. We had a successful experience there. In Bonn, we facilitated. The Afghans talked. But we stayed there for, I don't know, two weeks. We stayed there on the sidelines. We allowed the Afghanis to talk. Any time they needed our help, we were just there, ready to help. I think Yemen should be the same, and I think the United Nations has enough experience doing that, and we've been talking to them, and I hope they can do it. This idea of a, a forum for resolving uh, regional disputes specifically applied to, to Yemen, but uh, we'll come to Syria in a minute, is very promising. But if your Arab neighbors were here uh, taking part in this conversation, the first thing they would say is, we need assurances that Iran is not going to send uh, weapons, trainers, uh, IRGC forces into our countries. The, any one of those leaders would say, we look around our region, we see Baghdad, we see Damascus, we see Beirut, we see increasingly Yemen, in effect under control of Iranian proxy. So how do you reassure them that you're not, you're not going to be meddling in their uh, in inter internal affairs in those countries? Well, uh, I, I, I think we've got to be more respectful of the people of our region to believe that Iran can run all these capitals with proxies. Nobody, I believe me, nobody can run Yemen <laughs> other than Yemenis. People, that may be, that may be people, a different question. People have tried. Believe me, people have tried in the past. And that's why we believe Yemen was a quagmire for those who got involved. Everybody in the right mind believed that Yemen was an area that you should stay away from, allow the Yemenis to resolve their problems, help them. Yemen is not a theater for war. It's a theater for humanitarian assistance. Iran, you see, is a force that cannot be neglected in this region. As Saudi Arabia is a force that cannot be neglected in our region. We're not trying to exclude anybody. I didn't ask Saudi Arabia not to be invited to Geneva too, because they supported Daesh, because they provided arms to Daesh, because they provided financial assistance to Daesh. I didn't ask another country to be excluded because every month a thousand uh, new recruits are crossing its borders into, into Syria and Iraq to join Daesh. We didn't ask it because it was impractical. It was imprudent to exclude any regional country. But I was excluded from attending Geneva too. I think it is important for people to deal with reality. I can tell you that Iran wants peace with all its neighbors. We believe that peace in the immediate neighborhood, in the Persian Gulf region, is imperative for our security, for our prosperity. But we do not allow people to arbitrarily decide that Iran should not play a role in this region, because that decision will not hold any water. Quite, it will quite. not have any impact on the ground. Iran is a serious player in this region. Let me give you uh, ju just one, one, one very brief example. And some of my friends have heard this. After the United States changed the government in Iraq, you call it liberation, whatever, after we had the new Iraqi government, <laughs> President Talibani came to the Security Council I was Iran's ambassador, a Persian, non-Arab. 
And President Talibani came and hugged me. And he shook hands with all the Arab ambassadors. And the Arab ambassadors came to me and said, why is it like this? And I told them, realistically, because for 30 years, you supported the wrong guy. And we supported the right guy. You should not forget the fact that the United States and all these countries in the region supported Saddam Hussein when he used chemical weapons against my people, against the Kurds, against others. If you want to forget it, I won't let you. And the region made that wrong decision. Now, people in the region feel very close to us because we were on the right side of history. And I think we will benefit from the fact that we were on the right side of history with the people of the region. So just to re return to this core issue from, from the standpoint of your, of your Arab neighbors, in this regional dialogue that you're proposing, which is, which is very, a very interesting and, and rich idea, would Iran be prepared to discuss limits on its involvement with groups in neighboring countries as part of this process of regional stability. Is that something you'd be prepared to discuss? Well, but what I've said is that the regional security mechanism should be based on principles of international law. And one of the most fundamental principles is non-interference in the internal affairs of other states. Iran is committed to that principle. Unfortunately, on our eastern borders, our people are being abducted by terrorists who are paid by certain foreign countries. So I want to switch the, the focus specifically now to Syria. Uh, High Representative Mogherini said yesterday, inviting the kind of Iranian role uh, in regional problems that, that you've described, that she would favor that, a, a major uh, role, she said. Um, and she indicated that she would be interested in seeing that happen in the case of Syria. My sense is that we're now in a period where the U.S. and Russia are trying to convene a smaller group of countries that could reconvene a, kind, a version of what we call Geneva II, a, a, a peace process uh, for Syria, a tr political transition process for Syria, and that Iran would then be invited as this got going. The U.S. has formally lifted its objections to Iran eventually taking part in such a, such a conference. Does that seem like uh, uh, an idea that's ripe? Is it time to move toward a real discussion of political uh, transition, stabilization, uh, end of, of this terrible war in Syria? Well, I, I guess I, I answered that. Iran always wanted this. There were others who were trying to exclude Iran to their own detriment. Uh, now, we believe that any uh, outcome in Syria should be Syrian-owned, uh, and then it should be facilitated by countries in the region, uh, and there is a lot that can be done. There is a need for glo global involvement in terms of suppressing terrorism, terrorism, I mean, financing of terrorists, recruitment of terrorists. I mean, we're, we're dealing with, with an issue of immense significance. Daesh is no longer a problem limited to Syria. Now, the recruitment of Daesh in Afghanistan is mind-boggling. And there are ideological clashes between Taliban and Al-Qaeda and Daesh. The joining of Daesh and Al-Qaeda in Yemen are, I mean, alarming. The fact that uh, Boko Haram is uh, pledging allegiance to Daesh, the fact that Al-Shabaab in Somalia the fact that certain Libyan factions, this is becoming a huge global threat. If anybody in our region or outside our region believed that Daesh could be used for limited, short-sighted political objectives against Iran, against Iraq, or against Syria, they now should find out or should see for themselves that this monster that they created, like the previous monsters that they created, and there are quite a few of them, Saddam Hussein, is a monster of their own creation, was a monster. Taliban, another monster of their own creation. Al-Qaeda, you remember Soviet invasion of Afghanistan? Another monster of their own creation. People, uh, as, as we, you say here, 
old habits die hard. Uh, and this is one old habit. To create temporary oppositions to your adversaries, which live to bother you and to become a nightmare right. for everybody. So we need to come to the realization that we need to fight this phenomenon. Iran and Saudi Arabia and other countries in the region have a common interest in fighting this, whether it's in Syria or in Iraq. And, and Syria is an important place where we need to focus upon because you cannot fight these terrorists and allow them to take refuge in Syria. This is what's happening now. There is a successful operation in Iraq, but they go back and regroup in Syria. So we need, we need to focus on Syria. I cannot comment on a proposal that I don't know about. I mean, U.S.-Russian joint action, I think any uh, resolution to this issue should come from the region or from the United Nations or from Syria itself. But we are not closing the door on any option to find a peaceful resolution in Syria. Any option uh, sounds like it includes the issue of political transition. You spoke about the growth of, of Daesh. I'm talking the, about option, not precondition. No, no, I, well, I don't mean to say precondition here, but, but, but any uh, person from the region, I think, uh, who's concerned about, about uh, Syria would say that the biggest recruiting poster for uh, Daesh today is the continued presence of Bashar al-Assad as president of Syria with his campaign of barrel bombs and other attacks on civilians so that uh, that, sh that people would say that has to be an issue for this process you're describing. Would you agree that that's ac ac an acceptable I, I, issue? I find, I find that premise to be unsupported by facts of the last three, four years. And I believe the reason we have the continued bloodshed in Syria is because people insisted on that precondition. You have to allow a dialogue. Now, we said from the beginning that Syrian situation does not have a military solution. You need to have a similar political process in Syria with ceasefire, with a national unity government, with inter-Syrian dialogue and reform, and finally leading to a new situation in Syria. But the Syrians should be the ones who will decide what would, the, what would be the elements of the new situation. If people from the outside want to set preconditions for the Syrians, what they should be the outcome. You see, it's as if you're negotiating in, about something and you want to uh, have an agreement about the results of negotiation before you start the negotiation. This is what the negotiations is all about. The Syrians should sit down together and decide what would be their future. You cannot tell them that this person should not be a part of your future, the other person should not be a part of your future. That should, you should allow the negotiations to resolve that. I'm not saying whether this is good or bad. What I'm saying is that this will prevent a negotiation from taking place. And unless you have a negotiation, you will not have a solution. And unless you have a solution, you will have continued bloodshed. So people who are accusing the government of Syria and who are saying that the government of Syria has the bl blood of so many people on its hands should go back and do a little bit of soul searching and tell themselves what prevented the ceasefire in Syria three years ago? What prevented the ceasefire in Syria two years ago? What prevented the ceasefire in Syria last year? The only thing that prevented the ceasefire in Syria during all that time was a precondition. What prevented the freeze? Why is the freeze in Aleppo frozen? Go ask huh, Stefan de Mestura, who froze the freeze in Aleppo? Was it the government in Damascus or the opposition? People should come to realize that opposition and fighting has become a business. That business should end. And we should have a peace process geared toward national reconciliation and national unity government in Syria. And I do not arrogate to myself the responsibility of deciding what the outcome of that process will be before the Syrians sit around the negotiating table and start discussing that outcome. Mr. Minister, I, I want to ask you one more uh, question. Uh, uh, and it's a, a personal one because it involves my colleague uh, Jason Rezaian. 
who has been imprisoned uh, in Iran for more than a year on charges of espionage that his family, his newspaper, and now the U.S. government, uh, in, in the voice of President Obama uh, last Saturday, say are false. And so I want to ask you, in the, in the spirit of the moment, we're talking about momentous agreements, uh, in the spirit of what President Obama has called mutual interest and mutual respect, wouldn't this be a good time uh, for the release of my colleague Jason? Well, uh, as I told you in Munich, and I'm telling you again, that I hope that no one, nobody will be lingering in prison, including a lot of Iranians who committed no crime across the world, but are waiting in prison to be extradited to the United States for violating U.S. sanctions, which are illegal anyway. One of them died in the Philippines in prison. So I'm not trying to make a quid pro quo, but I'm just saying that, of course, I mean, the, 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 the Washington Post has a much better publicity campaign about Jason than we have about people who are lingering in prisons in, in Southeast Asia, elsewhere, who committed no crime. Unfortunately, your friend and my friend, Jason, uh, is accused of a very serious offense. And I hope that he's cleared in a court. But he will have to face a court. He's an Iranian citizen. Uh, it is unfortunate that some overzealous uh, low-level operative tried to take advantage of him. And I don't go into further detail because that's a pending case before the court. Uh, and I hope that he will be cleared of that charge. But, but the fact is that there are people who take advantage of the needs of some of uh, some people who try to get a visa to come to the United States or get a visa for their wives to come to the United States and make demands that are uh, illegal and dangerous and damaging to the professionalism of a journalist. But I still continue to hope that Jason will be able to clear his name before a court. As I said in, in Munich, when I asked you the same question, I, I appreciate your expressing your own personal sympathy for Jason and Jason's, Jason's case. I want to turn now to the audience uh, for uh, questions, and I would like to recognize uh, first, um, assuming that he's here, uh, Frank Wisner, uh, who has been uh, active uh, in the track to the sort of support for this process for so many years with Suzanne DiMaggio, our host here, and I just want to note the immense role that, that Frank and his colleagues have played. So Frank, a question from you. David, thank you. Minister, if I could add my own appreciation to having you on this very important occasion be as frank as you have been. I'd like to ask you if you would take a step back in your presentation this morning to a fascinating description of your vision of the region, taking us back to 1986, and your suggestion that Iran is committed to the shaping of a new architecture of security for the region. Let me ask you to think about that and take us a bit further with two questions. First. Trust is a problem, so how do you build trust? What steps can be taken to convene the parties to that understanding? Second, what kind of understanding does Iran have in mind when it talks about new security architecture for the area? Shall I? Yes, please. Well, thank you, Ambassador Wisner, for that very pertinent question. I think. Uh, you would not need confidence building measures if you had plenty of trust in any region. And we had situations, I mean, my, my model is CSC and, and then OSC in Europe, which was built on absolute mistrust and confrontation uh, during the Cold War, uh, but, but led to a significant organization that has been able to operate for, for the past uh, many years. So what, what's important 
uh, is to take the necessary steps. So uh, what needs to be done first is a set of principles that everybody should share. And I tried to allude to those principles in my, in my op-ed piece. Principles that everybody accepts, but it's important for us to reiterate them. Uh, sovereign equality, independence, sovereignty, respect for borders, inviolability of international borders, non-interference in the internal affairs, peaceful settlement of disputes, you see non-use of force that is unfortunately taking place. All of this would be the starting principles as they used in, in, in the Helsinki process, they called them tickets. For you to enter this process, you need to accept these principles. Then there are confidence building measures. The CBMs can include anything from promoting cultural exchanges and tourism to interaction between relig religious leaders. Now we have a very serious problem and that is the problem of sectarianism in our region. And there is a need for our religious leaders to start interacting in order to find common ground. This is a, this is a problem that would not be limited to one country or one area. It will be a global problem if it gets out of hand. And there is no reason for that. Islamic sects have lived together for the past 1400 years. And there have been short instances of clash, but in every case, those clashes were not theological, they were political. So political leaders abuse theological differences in order to advance their political cause or their political game in my, way, in my view. And we are committed, as the minority in the Muslim world, we have a, an existential interest in preventing a sectarian clash. Nobody in Iran would be looking for a sectarian clash because we, we will be uh, undermined in, 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 in a sectarian war. So these are, Frank, all the measures that we can take in order to move this process forward. And I believe a vision should develop in our region. Security cannot be bought. Security cannot be imported. Security must be fostered from within. And I think that is an important understanding, maybe even self-evident to many, but it requires a great deal of uh, soul-searching for our region to come to that conclusion. Uh, let me just uh, note to members of the audience, if you have a question, I see hands raised, you should write it down and give it to the um, people who are the organizers or tweet it to the tweet, uh, Twitter address that's, that's been given and it'll be passed up to me and I'll try to get to it. I want to begin with a question about Saudi Arabia with which you have uh, tried to, uh, some diplomatic outreach uh, from what I read and, and what I hear. And the, the question, uh, this is unsigned, but, uh, but it's an interesting one. Uh, Mr. Minister, King Salman uh, of Saudi Arabia reshuffled the government today, including changing the crown prince and foreign minister. How do you see this affecting relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia? And I guess more generally, I'd ask, how, how is your diplomatic uh, engagement with Sa Saudi Arabia going? Well, we have good bilateral relations with Saudi Arabia. Unfortunately, it has been marred in the past several weeks by this uh, sexual molestation of two of our pilgrims in Jeddah airport by Saudi police officers, but the Saudi authorities are promising us, including the new crown prince, who is the Minister of Interior, who, who promised our f ambassador uh, about two weeks ago in their private meeting, that they will bring them to justice, to the full extent of the law. Uh, and this was a very, very serious crime. Uh, but, but other than that, bilaterally, we don't have any difficulty with Saudi Arabia, and we are prepared to engage with them multilaterally uh, because we do not see a, uh, I mean, we, we, we see that we have common challenges and common opportunities in the region. We don't see our threat, our uh, interest in the region to be mutually exclusive. This is our perception. I certainly hope that they have the same perception because as you say, I'm not a dancer, but it takes two to tango. So, uh, I mean, I won't be able to do this alone. We require serious partners in Saudi Arabia to engage in, 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 in serious discussion. So that, that's what uh, we, we're interested in. We respect the decisions of the government of Saudi Arabia. We recognize the government of, the, of Saudi Arabia as the sovereign government uh, in, in that country. 
and we respect their decision. It's, it's, it's a decision of the King of Saudi Arabia to change his foreign minister. We will deal with uh, now former ambassador Adel al Jubair, now uh, foreign minister Adel al Jubair. We, we have respect for him as we had respect for his predecessor, uh, Prince Saud. This is a, a question via Twitter from uh, Anand Girid Naradza, I hope I'm uh, pronouncing that right, who is a New York Times reporter, and the, the question is a simple, direct one. Why does hatred of America have such force in Iran, and how can we, and I'd include how can you, dissipate it? Well, it, it, it's the behavior. And I believe skepticism about the U.S. is widespread in Iran, unfortunately. I don't find that appealing, but, but, but it's, it's a reality in, in, the, in Iran. Even American polling uh, organizations who have taken polls in Iran indicate that they, the, a, a, a large majority of Iranians want a resolution, but a, an even larger majority of Iranians don't trust the United States. So it's a good place to begin. I think we have an agreement or we will have an agreement, I hope. It's in the interest of everybody. And the, even the leader said that this will be a test for us, whether we can, in fact, engage in other areas. Now, our engagement with the United States is limited to the nuclear issue. This is the easiest issue to resolve because there are no contradicting objectives. We have, we have very similar objectives. We want no weapons and we want to have normal relations with, with the West, not yet the United States, with, with, with the West. If we reach that understanding, which shouldn't be that difficult, then we can build on it, and we can see whether this provides a good foundation to engage in other areas. We haven't made that determination yet because the jury is still out. Once we have an agreement, if we have one, and once we start implementing that in good faith, we will see whether we can dense that wall of mistrust that unfortunately exists between our two countries. The, I brought along a, a quotation from the Supreme Leader. Uh, if the other side stops its usual obstinacy, this will be an experience for us, and we will find out that we can negotiate with it over other matters as well. So that was what I was referring I to. I want to come back to... Uh, that, that seems like a, a, an invitation to something broad. I want to come back to the question. Here's, this is from Tara Kangarlu from Al Jazeera America, who asks, if slash when an Iran deal is reached, would you support establishing diplomatic relations with the United States? It's too early and too premature to state that. And, uh, we, we need to take one step at a time. I don't see that in the, in the immediate future. I want to be able to resolve this issue, to remove uh, that cloud from our region and get to the region. Uh, I, I said in my article in, in Ashag al said that our region is our priority. And I really believe that we need a stable region. That's my priority. My priority is to move and work with our neighbors in the region to deal with, with these common threats, Daesh, extremism, sectarianism. These are immediate threats to them, immediate threats to us, and if people believe that, immediate threats to the world at large. So that, that's where I want to focus uh, once we move from, from this issue. Even as we deal with this issue, we're focusing on that. You have spoken at uh, uh, length and interestingly about the region, about regional stability, so there's one obvious question that hasn't been asked, and it's been submitted by, by uh, a member of the audience. Would you negotiate with Israel without prior conditions? No, because we have a situation where those who are directly involved have been the subject of continued violation of their most, I mean, elemental rights, the right to exist, the right to statehood. Uh, they have to resolve those problems. Uh, it's, not, it's not our land that is occupied. It's not our people who are driven from their homes. It's not our people who are being bombarded once every two years in Gaza. So they have to address their problems. They shouldn't look for scapegoats. 
or smoke screens. So, so it, it, does that mean that if those problems uh, involving the Palestinians uh, in, in Gaza and elsewhere, if, if those problems were resolved, would Iran then be willing to negotiate with Israel? Well, why, why do we need to? I mean, it's, it's not our problem. It's a problem that the Palestinians have faced for 60 years. And from our perspective, it's a policy of aggression, of domination that has prevented a resolution of this crisis over the past 60 years. You're looking at the wrong address. Iran is not your problem. I mean, we're not, we're, we're not doing anything. I mean, it's, it is a policies that, that have continued to simply neglect the right of an entire nation to live as a state, Palestine. And once that issue is resolved, then Iran is nowhere to interfere. Let me uh, take a question from Carol Tweet in the audience, uh, who is from the Franklin Street Policy Group. And she, she asks, if the nuclear deal proceeds as expected and sanctions are lifted, what are the possibilities for more open democratic political processes in Iran? Well, uh, everybody can have more democracy, but, but I ask you, you find one state in our region for, in which over the past 34 years, government administrations have changed hands through elections, and each government has presided over the election of its opposition into office. Find a single other, single, I'm, I'm, I mean single, in every democratic, so-called democratic country in our region, you've had at least two coup d'etats in, in, the, in the last 34 years. In Iran, every election, and I, you want me to name the elections? President Rafsanjani elected President Khatami, who at that time was his opposition. President Khatami elected President Ahmadinejad, who at that time was his opposition, continues to be. President Ahmadinejad elected President Rouhani, who at that time and now is his opposition. So find another single example in our region. So before preaching human rights to Iran, please preach it to your allies. But I, I noticed that when you came back from Lausanne uh, to Tehran, there seemed to be a lot of Iranians who were pretty happy about what you'd done and were pretty excited by it, um, which led a lot of us uh, observing Iran from afar to think that, yeah, there was a, a desire to move out of this period of isolation into something new, something more open. Uh, I'm not wrong about that, am no, I? No, you're not. The Iranian people want, I mean, the Iranian people went to the polls, trusted the polls, 73% of the Iranian population trusted the polls after everything that had been said about Iran. And I was in the opposition during the last six, eight years. I was in, uh, at home most of the time uh, in, in early retirement. So um, you, don't, you don't expect me to, to be very... Uh, friendly to President Ahmadinejad. But, but the point is, Iranians decided in a free election, after all the publicity, after everybody inviting them to stay home, after every foreign radio and television station telling them that your vote doesn't count, they said no to them and went to the polls. In large numbers, 73% of them and chose a president who wanted to have interaction based on dignity with the rest of the world. Of course they'll be happy if that reaches a positive conclusion. That's the platform on which President Rouhani was elected, interaction with dignity. So these two words are the operative words. If interaction succeeds without dignity, I don't think any Iranian will come to the streets to welcome me. And I believe they will choose any event, any time, I will choose dignity over interaction. If I'm supposed to sacrifice my national dignity in order to be able to interact, then I'll stay home. So let, let me ask you a question. This may be our, our final one. We'll see. Um, about the subject of American politics. 
Uh, I don't interfere in the internal I'm not the asking you to. <laughs> that, was the, that was the first the ticket principle. Senator Cotton aside, um, uh, uh, here's the question, and it's, it's, it's an interesting one. Many of the candidates preparing to run for president in 2016, particularly the Republicans, have suggested they will take a tougher position with your government. Do you worry about this, or do you believe the status quo will essentially be maintained no matter who wins in 2016? I believe the United States will risk isolating itself in the world if there is an agreement and it decides to break it. And I don't think anybody will find that decision by the United States acceptable. And I think what runs in the world today is how people perceive a decision to be legitimate. I think the United States, whether you have a Democratic president or whether you have a Republican president, is bound by international law, whether some senators like it or not. And international law requires the United States to live up by the terms of an agreement that this government enters into. You know that, um, maybe Senator Cotton doesn't, but you know that 90% of U.S overseas agreements are executive agreements. And that is not recent. From 1933 onwards, you have executive agreements that have stood the test of decades. Various administration, even change in global environment from, cold, from a bipolar world to a whatever transitional phase, from cold war to non-cold war to another cold war, all sorts of stuff have, have happened in the world, and you've had executive agreements which have stayed and which have continued to operate. You know that the, the status of force agreement that you have with Iraq is an executive agreement. You know that the Algiers Accord that you have with Iran is, is, is an executive agreement. You know that the agreement that you have with Afghanistan is an executive agreement. None of them have been ratified in, by U.S. Congress. And they stand. So if, if the U.S. Senate wants to send a message to the rest of the world that all of these agreements that the United States has signed, 90% of U.S. international agreements, are invalid, then you will have chaos in your bilateral relations with the rest of the world. I mean, you're welcome to do it, but, 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 but I don't think that would be something that the, even the most radical elements in, in, in Congress want to see. Well, with that message to, uh, to, to Congress, um, join me in thanking uh, Mr. Zarif. Thank you. Thank you.